creators of visual programming tools for software development, is pleased to provide major funding for the Computer Chronicles, the story of this continuing evolution. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffe, and sitting in this week for Gary Kildall is Herb Lechner of SRI. Herb, what we have up on our Apple computer here today is the Koala Micro Illustrator and my handy Koala Pad here. And we see a menu of some artists' choices. And if I can, I'm going to try to communicate to you here uh, in some computer graphics. And so far, it's working. If I get your name right. There we go. And I can even make it a little more sexy than that. We'll give you a little brighter background color so it's a kind of more upbeat message. Uh, Herb, computer graphics is the subject of our show today. And computer graphics, in fact, involves more than just this little thing we're playing with or even video games, which some people associate with computer graphics. There are some pretty serious applications, aren't there? Very much so, Stuart. Uh, computer fine art hangs in galleries right alongside of traditional art. And, of course, in the commercial area, uh, computers aid animators and uh, are, play a very important role in TV advertising uh, today. And, of course, the basic building blocks of computer art, that is, the graphics uh, subsystems, uh, play a role not only in art, but in related activities such as computer-aided design and other graphic ap applications. Okay, on today's program, we'll be looking at one of the newest computer graphic systems called IRIS. We'll look at a computer art system called the Paint Box, and we'll meet two computer artists, real people, that is. First, let's take a look at the kind of computer art being done now on mainframe computers. Since the first light pen and graphics displays of the 1950s, computer-assisted artwork has been associated with beautiful, if mathematical, images of symmetry and abstraction. But the applications today extend far beyond repetitive patterns. With enough computing power, computer graphics can extend an artist's reach to cover the height and length of a wall or compress the time it takes to animate something from a month to an hour. Using a digitizing tablet, MIT artist Ron McNeil chooses from a palette of colors and pre-programmed images to create a collage that exists only in the computer's memory. Before ever seeing a canvas, it undergoes some dramatic transformations. Starting with materials from different sources, like photographs or three-dimensional objects, the composite can be manipulated to change in color, size, or geometric aspect. The screen-sized image shown here is only an intermediate step toward the final hard copy, a painting that is 14 feet high and 48 feet long. Like a colossal paintbrush with a memory, the giant XY plotter magnifies the completed artwork into a wall-sized mural, strip by strip and color by color. As an ingenious collaboration between digital imagery and robotics, the giant plotter is unique. But the special talents of computer graphics are increasingly used in another area of the visual arts, animation. To an art form that was once the near-exclusive province of film, computers offer a much faster method of animating images. Again, through a digitizing tablet, an artist can create a figure by drawing in just enough points to determine its size and rough shape. For a symmetrical object, all the computer needs is the outline of one side, which is then shaped into a fluid form, regenerated, and filled in with color and three-dimensional detail. The software calculates and reproduces the characteristics of light and shadow that the object would possess in 3D. Finally, to animate the drawing, the artist specifies some key camera positions from which the object is viewed in space. The program then fills in the missing frames that simulate movement between those points. Making a drawing come to life is the most tedious part of an animator's job. Fortunately, it is also readily adaptable to digital processing. The systems used to produce these images are not designed to replace artists, but to assist them. And with enough human talent, they can mimic reality in detail or expand it to the fringes of our imagination. Our guests around the table now are Michael Arendt. Michael is a computer artist and design director with Aaron Marcus & Associates in Berkeley. And next to Michael is Don McKinney, vice president with Silicon Graphics here in Mountain View in the Silicon Valley. Herb? Michael, in your consultant role, you use all kinds of computer uh, graphics equipment. You have a setup here today for us. Do you want to tell us a little bit about this equipment and what you're going to do? 
Well, this is a, uh, an 8-bit microcomputer, which is very similar to the type of uh, computers that most of the viewers uh, would use in their home, for instance, to play games. Uh, and we use these type of systems, for instance, to create imagery for digital directories and, uh, and uh, ed education software and such like that. And, and what exactly do you, show us how you use this system here. Okay, well, w the traditional artist tool is, uh, is a, a brush. This is an electronic artist tool, and it's using a graphics tablet, which you see here, and an electronic pen. And with this, I can, I can uh, uh, paint images and uh, put uh, graphics, combine graphics, photographic images, and text uh, on the screen. I can very quickly load in an image here, for instance, to show you a, uh, a raw photographic image that was uh, input using a video digitizer, which is simply a video camera. And once I get the uh, image into the computer... That's an unfortunate example, by yeah. the way, Michael, but we'll go with it. <laughs> once I get the image into the computer, then I can uh, use this graphics tablet to take away parts of the image that I don't want. As you can see here, it's loading in this microcomputer. What do you mean by parts of the images you don't want, Michael? Well, for instance, uh, maybe I want to take out a background and put in another background, or I want to take out areas where I would like to put in other types of things, like text and things like that, which I'll demonstrate here. I'll show you, uh, for instance, I'm showing you the build of an image. Don, while Michael is working here a second, uh, there are great memory demands, aren't there, in doing graphics? Uh, how do you accomplish that with, a, with just a small microcomputer? Well, and really it depends on the exact amount of memory. The, the memory uh, requirements really are the requirements of the amount of color that you have and, uh, and also the, what we call the resolution of the screen. So the, the higher and smoother the image appears, the more memory is required. Uh, in the case of what you'll see later today, we have approximately 3 million bytes of of memory just used to store an image mm -hmm. uh, in real time. Okay, Michael, I'm, yeah, I'm sorry, you're ready. Okay, now I've taken away the background, now I've put in a cartoon bubble here, and then I can load in another uh, image here to show you uh, other things that I've... Uh, so you're loading images you've pre-prepared. Yes, I pre-prepared these how, images. How did you go about getting the old background out? Did you trace around it or something? <clears throat> Uh, yes, you can, uh, you can block it out with a function on the tablet uh, using a, bl a black background block out. And then so, as you can see, the image is slowly building here, and then I'll show you the final image that I've created, and then I can uh, show you how you can manipulate that image other ways also. What, what is the, tab the tablet you're using? Tell me how that works. Well, it works by uh, uh, addressing various areas in the computer memory and essentially it's giving it a command either to put color onto the screen or putting uh, ge uh, geometric uh, figures on the screen like circles or grids and you can also put text on the screen as you see here. Here's the final image I've built which has a combination of a photographic image, mm -hmm. it has graphics in the background and it has uh, text also combined with those graphics and I've been able to do that with this tablet. I can also, for instance, do things like turn the image upside down, or I can also flip-flop the image this way here, and then I could bring it back up. I can also invert the colors, for instance, so I can make it negative or make them in new colors. And then there are other functions on the tablet, too, that you can do. Uh, for instance, you can create textures with uh, what's called electronic brushes and things like that. Hmm. Okay, well, we're moving our way up from the simple koala pad to something more sophisticated, and Don, that gets us into your area. And I think you have your iris system set up over in the other part of the uh, studio here, so let's take a walk over and see what iris does. Don, how does your iris system here differ from what we've seen up until now? Up until now, it's really, we've really been looking at microcomputers, really personal computers, and this is really a different class of machine. The biggest difference, though, that separates us out is the idea of us using custom chips developed by Silicon Graphics for our own use to do these three-dimensional calculations. This example here is a Rubik's Cube, and what's, what's going on here is we're calculating the location of all the endpoints of all the faces so that we can rotate those in 3D and do all the hidden surface removals all in a very real-time mode. Why don't we go on to the next okay. uh, demonstration here to give a, an idea of how our machine can be used. What kind of machine, what's the hardware we're using here, Don? This is a terminal configuration that has a little floppy disk on top, but the, the, uh, 
basic computer that we're using here is a Motorola 68000, often used in some of the other um, reasonably high performance micro microcomputers. Uh, other, the other chips that we actually have are, are called what we call our geometry engine, and it's a high speed three dimensional floating point calculation uh, unit that, that runs at six and a half million floating point operations per second. Um, this speed we, in, we are planning to enhance to over 10 million floating point operations just in, in a okay, few what's, minutes. What's the demo here? This one is a series of uh, pictures of a, a series of buildings where we're doing a calculation in, in real time. So I'm going to angle up away from the buildings and I'm going to zoom back away. And as I'm zooming away, you can see this, this building get, be, going further and further back. You can see that the light sourcing is done so that uh, the certain surfaces that are closer to the, to the rays of sun are, are visible. Now what I'll do is I'll add uh, buildings in 3D. So you can see as I move around the space, I can actually get the full panoramic effect of this block. Or I can even zoom in. So I can go through areas. Let's okay. skip on to the next. The next is... What, uh, before we get to that, Don, what would the application be, say, of something like this architectural thing you just showed me? Um, <clears throat> we have several customers that are in the A, E, and C market, the architectural engineering and construction business, and we have several local companies that are doing piping diagrams and piping calculations for intersections of pipes in, say, nuclear plants. Another case might be for an architectural firm that would, would add software to our product and sell it to the end-user end user architectural people for doing building design, for doing uh, construction of faces, uh, landscape architectural design, um, even an interior decorating. Use it to place desk and uh, furniture within a given room. Okay, tell me about this demo now. Okay, this one is, uh, again, it's a three-dimensional object. Uh, it's a, rep a rendering of a robot. So the first thing I'm going to do here is, is get it a little bit larger. And then I'll, what I'll do is I'll tip it over so you can actually look at this robot arm from the top. And I'll spin the, the arm around. And now as I'm closer, let me uh, tilt it back up so you can see it from front, from the front view. And in this case, what I'm doing is I have a uh, one button. By touching it, I can cause the shoulder to, to, to move the entire arm up and down. Or I can cause... Um, another button can cause the forearm to move up and down, and then the last series, I can cause the pinchers to actually open and close or to even grip something. This, an application for this might be an auto assembly plant where you're grabbing a, a metal part to be welded into an, another area. Okay, we That's, have time maybe for one more, and I'll load your disk for you. Okay, this is another uh, sophisticated 3D application where we're actually computing the location of an aircraft in flight. So the first thing that will happen is we'll be looking out the front of the, the um, airplane at a, a, a building or a hangar, and then we're going to taxi up the runway, make a right turn, taxi down the runway, make another right turn, and take off. Okay, and you talked about the speed of about six and a half million. What was the unit's? Floating point computations per second. Um, most computers are measured in MIPS, and some are measured in what's called FLOPS, and the uh, difference being that it's either an integer mathematics or it's a floating point mathematics. Okay, let's see what this is. Okay, the, so what I'm doing now is I'm sitting at the runway, and I'm, gonna, I'm gonna, going to accelerate the uh, plane as it goes toward the building. I'm turning the rudder now using the mouse and locking in on a direction, and then I'm going to sweep, sweep around and get back onto the main runway. And now, as I I'll accelerate the plane still further, raise the flaps, just like in a normal takeoff, I can switch between the, uh, the viewing angle of the pilot looking um, out the front of the window to the viewing angle of the, uh, okay. from the tower. And now, now I'm off the ground. Done. That's very impressive. OK. If you watch television, you are familiar with computer graphics. Some of the effects you see on the computer chronicles are, in fact, generated by computer. Well, we'll see a very sophisticated video computer graphics system in just a minute. Joining us now is Ann Chase, who is a freelance computer artist, and Kevin Prince. Kevin is engineering manager at MCI Quantel. Now, Ann, you uh, played around with a picture of me at the break just before we got to the segment. Uh, that was animation, I take it. Mm -hmm. And how do you do that with this system? Well, basically, I can find that animation stack in the library and show you how I set it up just by tapping. It's cell by cell is how it's set up. And here you can see that I just drew the tie and rolled it up on your neck. 
So you captured the real picture and then drew on top of the real picture mm -hmm. and then just did the, the cell right, animation. Just cycled the animation in. Does this, does this machine do all that uh, with just commands that you give it? The yeah, basically, just your artistic ability and you know what you can do using the capabilities of the machine. Kevin, what are the capabilities of the machine? What kind of what kind of hardware, software supporting this system? Well, hardware-wise, we're based around the 68,000 processor, as the previous uh, people were talking about. But um, we've got a lot of dedicated hardware to do all the the fast wipes, the actual painting and drawing in the system, and changing all the brush sizes, etc. It's taken us some time to develop that, but associated with that is probably more importantly is the actual software uh, interaction with the, with the uh, with the user. Uh, everything you see is, is a, obviously a very large um, operating system that we've had to divide f for the system. And could you show us? You mentioned drawing and brush uh, strokes. Some of the freehand capability of the system. Basically, what I'll do here is just wipe the canvas, and you can see that I'm in a paint mode. And I'll, this shows me my brush size, and I'll take a white here, and you can see that I can just paint right on the screen. Mm -hmm. I can choose a different color just by tapping and say a larger brush size, and paint over the top of that. Then I can go back and choose that mixed color right off the image and store it to use later. Now, uh, this, this is obviously much finer drawing, greater resolution than some of the earlier things we saw at the beginning of the program. But that, that's a function of what, Kevin? That's basically the way we do our store manipulation, the way we actually store the picture. Uh, we have various methods of mapping the image that we're, we're actually trying to, to work with into the store, very different to uh, individual pixel operations which the other machines will be working with. And, and paint box is, in fact, in use right now in television graphics. How is it being used? Uh, well, the, most of the networks have actually got several, several of these systems, and they very often use the mach machine for uh, their news production. And uh, practically every night you will see some form of uh, over-the-shoulder shot that's probably been generated on the paint box. But hopefully it's so good you would never notice. Now, this system gives you the capability of mixing that which is artistically drawn with that which is real life That's photograph right. mm -hmm. uh, uh, sort of a thing. How is that done? Well, actually, I can just go to the live source, and you can see that right now we're taking in a live video source of what we're doing. And at any time, I can, I don't even look at myself. Let's just tap something down and see what we have here. There we have me. And okay, I can so go you ahead have and just captured right a now. still frame from mm -hmm. this live coverage of what you're doing right now, mm -hmm. and now you can paint with it. Right. Or I could, let's say I'd like to create a stencil. And just very quickly, I can go in here with a stencil medium and just outline something and fill it. And you're fill why are you filling that now? What I'm going to do is a cut and paste technique. This is a stencil medium that's laid over the image. What I'll do is... This is the word, word processing of art. Cut and paste. Yeah. That's, that's it, really. yes. Um, and then I'll just paste it up. At this point, we're taking a portion of that image, and we've now got, as you can see, see two images. There we are. <laughs> Twins. No, I think that's a vast improvement. <laughs> that's Twins. right. That's right. <laughs> and you, you seem to have a lot of fun doing this. Is there uh, an obst Is there resistance to uh, an artist, or shall we say a pure artist who's used to dealing in brushes and paints, uh, getting comfortable with using this technology? Um, maybe at first there's a, it's a little difficult to use the menu, to learn to think and actually read at the same time while you're drawing. But once you've worked with the system for a short period of time, it's just like second nature. Very simple to use. Set up in artist terms. The, uh, it's clear how valuable this would be to a television media. Mm -hmm. uh, what about the area of fine art? And uh, is, is uh, computer art catching on there too oh, or growing? Definitely, definitely. It's the wave of the future. That's what's going to be happening in art in a couple of years. In fact, it already is. Should brush, brush manufacturers worry? No, I mean, no, no, no. They're not in trouble yet. <laughs> not yet. Kevin, we have about a minute left. How far can you go with this technology? Will we get to the point where you could have, uh, where we could be replaced by animated people and sync it up with words? 
I sincerely hope not. Uh, <laughs> the way I see it at the moment is that we're providing the means by which an artist can extend their capabilities. We can turn a reasonable artist into a good one and an extremely good one into a superb artist. It's, there's, all we're doing is allowing them to create, create their artwork in a much shorter space of time and in the medium in which it's required. Well, that's fascinating. And you don't exist anymore on that picture, Kevin, but we know you're here. We're all out of time. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you for joining us on this edition of the Computer Chronicles. Focus, creators of visual programming tools for software development, is pleased to provide major funding for the Computer Chronicles, the story of this continuing evolution. Okay, yeah, no, I'm coming to the meeting. I'm just running about 15 minutes late. I'm on my way right now. Okay, bye. I'm driving along the freeway at 55 miles an hour, yet thanks to computers, I'm able to carry on a normal phone conversation. This cellular telephone depends on computers to hand off my conversation from one relay station to another. It's just one example of how computers and telephones are working together now to bring us a whole new array of technologies. Today, we take a look at computers and communications on this edition of the Computer Chronicles. The Computer Chronicles is brought to you in part by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Popular Computing, the magazine that gives readers an understanding of the technology and applications of microcomputers and software in office, home, and classroom. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffee, and this is Gary Kildall. And Gary, this nifty little device I have here is actually a computer terminal. I'm right now accessing a mini in Washington via satellite and FM transmission, and I can actually ask the computer back there in Washington for some uh, stock quotes, for example, uh, and I can see right now information that I'm getting uh, through this computer out of Washington. This is a good example of a computer, and there's an antenna communications. Mm -hmm. In general, Gary, how do those two technologies complement each other? Well, I think other? this is a very good example of that. In the days of the time sharing, we shared uh, computer resources and data, but uh, personal computers brought a lot of that computing and the personal data right onto your desk. And the personal data are things like your letters and your spreadsheets and the programs that you've written. But a lot of data can't be personalized. There are things like uh, large and changing databases, electronic mail, a variety of these things that are dynamically changing every day. Now that's where communications is really important. With a personal computer, then it lets you get at that information that's dynamically changing that can't be locally generated or produced. On today's program, we're going to see how you can use a touch-tone phone as a computer terminal. We'll watch color graphics being transmitted on a phone line, and we'll visit AT&T's Bell Labs in New Jersey. Let's begin first with a background look at what's been happening with computers and communications. The link between computers and communication is a natural one. Early computers were fast electromechanical switching devices, often relying on the same simple relays used by the telephone company. The soft clicking of relay switches was audible proof that messages were being transmitted. 
but faster and denser signals were the key to faster communication. And today, what the integrated circuit did for the computer, fiber optics and digital code are doing for the telephone. As part of a nationwide experiment, eastern Pennsylvania is being wired with a fiber optic network capable of transmitting 1.7 billion bits of data per second, or about 170,000 simultaneous conversations. Lasers transmit the data in pulses, representing digital bits. Since there is no need to translate digital to analog signals, the fibers can carry computer data just as easily as voice data. Your phone line becomes a computer network. Customers taking part in the Harrisburg experiment can choose some remarkably intelligent telephones. One attachment features an LCD readout that gives you the number of the person calling you as they accumulate during your absence. There are phones that remember the last call you dialed or the one you just missed. And you can program your phone to identify callers with programmed rings. The system is also capable of tracing a call and will even reject calls from people you would rather avoid. While some of these arcane services may not suit everyone, they point the way towards a new era in telecommunications. Computers inside telephones and telephones inside computers. With us now in the studio is William Gillis. Bill is Executive Vice President of Schwab Technology Services, a division of Charles Schwab & Company. Bill has been with RCA, the and Mattel Electronics. Next to Bill is Bob Metcalf. Bob, the founder and chairman of 3Com Corporation, a PC networking company. Bob was formerly with Xerox Park, and Bob is the inventor of Ethernet. Bob, you know, there seems to be two classes of users, I guess, of personal computers, those that are used in the business and office and the individual. And as individuals, we seem to have inherited the phone system as our way of communication. Is this going to place any really inherent limitations on what we can do with, uh, with the computer communications? Well, our personal computers are getting smarter and smarter very quickly, and as they do so, they want to communicate more and more information, and the 100-year-old uh, telephone network is beginning to be stressed. Is this going to be improved? Is it going to be improvements? and it's the, way, you know, the rates at which we can communicate? Absolutely. There's a lot of progress being made among the telephone companies to increase the amount of data they can carry, but also cable TV companies and other means are being developed mm -hmm. as well. Explain, Bob, the importance of moving to a digital rather than an analog kind of phone system. Uh, starting 10 or 15 years ago, digital electronics began to reduce the cost of voice communication, but now uh, more and more, by going digital, not only are you reducing cost, but you're providing communication more suited to computer communication. Mm -hmm. And Bill, you have an example here of how we do the kind of thing Bob was talking about. Let's start off with, the, with I think, what you call uh, Schwab quotes in that telephone. Sure, it's a telephone-based uh, stock quotation and news service that's accessible from any touchstone telephone. I could give you an example of that. Please. I'll quickly dial in to our system, although you can dial from any touch-tone telephone. You don't need a special phone like the one that I'm using today. Welcome to the Schwab Quote Service. Please enter your account number. My account number? Now enter your password. And my password. So you're basically using just a telephone as a kind of computer terminal to access another computer's database. That's exactly right. Yeah, so you can place your orders here just like you would uh, through a broker and, and just do it directly? Not with the telephone service. I can transfer to a broker, but I can't actually I buy or okay. sell with the telephone service. You have a computer-based computer version of this also. Is that true that you're going to show us? That's correct. And that one will allow you to actually buy or sell. Mm -hmm. I can show you that. You can do actual research. You can buy or sell stock or maintain your portfolio. In this case, I think I'll buy some of Bob's company. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> so you're going to give us a demonstration of, of how you can use this software package to be your own broker, in a sense? That's correct. This package called the Equalizer that allows you to buy, sell, do your research. I'll just call up a portfolio and put in a buy order by typing the letter B. COMS being Bob's company. And I'll buy his common stock by indicating an S and 100 shares. Okay, you're not actually online yet, Bill, I'm right? not online yet, and that's one of the beauties of the system. It allows you to format your orders before you actually go online, which saves in communications cost. And I don't know the cost of the product, so I will ask for the market price and then a day order, which I've now accepted. And at this point, 
I will actually sign online to actually buy the stock. Okay. Now this is a, is a good example again of what we were talking about earlier in the sense that there's some local computing going on here, preparation of the order, getting it all set and ready to go, and then you use, you got to use your phone system to connect to a bigger computer system where the transactions actually take place. The Correct. transactions themselves couldn't have been done locally in the personal computer because of the, of the large database. That's true. There's thousands upon thousands of stocks, mm -hmm. and that would overload the capacity of most small computers. Okay, Bill, you are online now, and what's happening? We're logging onto the system now. It's actually sending in my trading password, which will be acknowledged. The system now tells me that at last time I signed on was earlier this morning. It's receiving data back now, which will allow mm -hmm. me to continue the process and finalize placing the order. And what you're doing here is not really sending an order to a broker somewhere. You're actually placing and executing the order yourself. That's correct. I'm signed into our host computer. The order would be examined by a broker who would then hit one key to forward it on to the exchanges. In this case, we're now on online. To finalize the transaction, I'll just hit two more keys. It's sending the request to buy Bob's company stock receiving data back acknowledging now that that has done, been done and the order has been placed in our host computer system. Now, Bob, this is a, a really good example of using the current technology to, to make a good effect. Is there, is there, uh, where do you see this going in terms of just say an individual getting access to large databases? Well, the, the computers are getting, uh, as you well know, uh, smarter and smarter. And as they get smarter and smarter, their uh, appetite for information grows dramatically. So there's a lot of pressure on the, the uh, telephone companies again uh, to accommodate this uh, greater appetite. Mm -hmm. uh, I think another area that's going to come strongly is the use of PCs, not only for database access, as you just saw here, but electronic mail. Now, Bob, we hear a lot about AT&T's role in the deregulation and how important that may be to this merger of computers and communications. How important was that deregulation in this technology? The, de the regulation tended to um, uh, put a wet blanket on uh, innovation. I think now that a higher level of competition has been introduced, we can expect a higher turnover of uh, uh, equipment to newer technologies, particularly technologies uh, suitable for computer communication. Well, how about uh, some alternate forms of communication? We, we hear about satellite transmission and things of that sort. Gonna, is that ever going to uh, take place for an individual? So we say we can really get a high data rate uh, transfer to an individual rather than, say, a corporation? Uh, I think that's a little further out mm -hmm. than um, you might like, uh, but there are a direct broad broadcast satellite to homes is uh, coming up. Of course, that's one way. Mm -hmm. And so that in order to use computer communication, you'd have to go the next step to have two-way direct broadcast satellite. Mm -hmm. That's quite a bit in the future. You mentioned also cable TV. How do you see using cable TV transmission capability with regard to computers? Uh, well, television has the un uh, either the pleasurable or the unpleasurable feature that it's one way. That is, uh, we're broadcasting information over TV in one direction. Computers need two-way, but uh, now many ways are being found, found to apply the cable TV network to do two-way communication, to get data to go through those uh, uh, cables both directions. But I guess what we're, uh, the real challenge then right now is to use the existing telephone network to its, its best advantage then. Well, this whole communication infrastructure is a vast investment, and it's not the sort of thing you want mm -hmm. to throw away in a day. So we, it taxes our ingenuity to think of ways of using that installed base of equipment. Gentlemen, thank you. In just a minute, we're going to see how you can actually transmit color graphics over a phone line, and we'll take a look at the newest machines from AT&T. So stay with us. AT&T's famous Bell Labs in New Jersey, home of countless technological innovations, but mostly in the field of communications. For up until last year, AT&T was the phone company. But now with deregulation and divestiture, AT&T is free to move into other ventures, and one of its first and biggest new ventures is the move into computers. AT&T's communication uh, heritage will bring to the, the uh, computer uh, user the ability to have these computers converse with each other in a natural way, in a, in a friendly way, and make processing and data communications as easy as voice telephony has been made by AT&T and by the direct distance dialing network and other advances such as these. AT&T's new machines represent a different approach from its first computer products, relying instead on the communications giant's traditional strength, data transmission. At the top of the line is the new 7300, called the Unix PC. 
designed for multi-user, multitasking applications. It features the overlapping windows of the Macintosh, a Unix operating system, and a telephone manager. We have given the user, presented this to the user in a way that communications becomes a natural modality at last. We've taken the, uh, the telephony, the, the you know, just plain old phone, uh, hooked it into the, to the machine such that uh, the user really can control uh, who they're calling. For example, a telephone call uh, would come in, you can put the name of the person who called, and you can have a whole history of your last five conversations with that person. The computer's telephone with a memory and electronic mail are designed to interface with AT&T's new one megabit network, providing fast, all-digital transmission of both voice and data simultaneously. Goodbye modem, hello Unix. It matches the, the needs of the user to the interface. And it does this by integrating all the communications in a way that it's at your fingertips. And it's as easy as dialing a, a phone to use, the, to use a very powerful computer. Now, it's implemented with the Unix operating system. But to me, that's a, that's a detail. That's our, that's our magic. Unix is our magic. Some industry watchers have characterized the next computer era as a battle between two giants, IBM and the phone company. But AT&T doesn't see it that way. Yes, IBM's a competitor, but I don't think it's a battle of the titans in terms of, uh, of the way people say it. I think it's really, in, in, in some ways, um, a, a real advantage for the U.S. To, uh, to allow two very strong companies like AT&T and IBM uh, to prepare for the real onslaught, and that's of the Japanese, uh, uh, of the Japanese computing. In fact, the challenge from Japan points out a basic difference between the Japanese and American styles of distributing data. While Japanese research gives high priority to making mainframes more friendly, Americans take a more local approach. Uh, in the U.S., people are fiercely independent and they like to be autonom autonomous. And to me, that says that they need control over their data. The bad news is what we've done is we've created millions of islands of computing that must be linked together. Once we solve that basic problem of making things really friendly, everyone likes to talk about friendly user and fun to use, but really friendly, you know, natural languages, easy to communicate, it's problem oriented, it solves my problem in the way I think about it. Once we solve that problem, the explosion in uh, uh, what people have called the explosion in the last three years in computing will basically look like a foothill. AT&T seems well positioned to be a major player in the field of computers and communications, having added computers to its communications expertise. But IBM has added communications to its computer expertise by acquiring Rome Corporation, a major telecommunications firm. Robin Garthwaite has more on the IBM Rome connection. Opening the lines of communication. That's what Rome Corporation and other telecommunications companies are helping the computer user to do. Now, logging onto a database can be done with a touch of a single button, and voice and data calls can take place at the same time. We are trying to make accessing data as easy as making a phone call. That is, right now no one thinks twice about picking up their phone and calling someone anywhere in the world. It's much more difficult to do that when you want to call any computer anywhere in the world. And the goal is to make it as simple as possible to do both of those things without having to sacrifice one for the other. Products such as Rome Cedar give the user not only personal computer capabilities, but also highly developed telecommunication functions. And, and these products are really designed for the, the communication intensive knowledge worker who I can't afford to have to say, I can't get any phone calls, I can't make any phone calls, I'm on the computer right now. The fact that personal computers are becoming more commonplace and people want to do more with them is just putting more and more pressure on, on the telecommunications industry to, to respond to that. New products, new ideas. In the telecommunications field, there doesn't seem to be a limit. But having this much power can present a problem. I think I just ordered a pizza in 15 states. This is Robin Garthwaite for the Computer Chronicles. Stuart, it appears that for at least this point in time, uh, the big question is how do we get the most out of our existing telephone network? 
Well, Gary, I think we have a pretty good example of how you do something pretty impressive with the phone company. Let me introduce Glenn Albinger. Glenn is the director of software systems for the Computer Color Works in Sausalito. And next to Glenn is Barry Marjoram, vice president for defense systems marketing at Grid Systems Corporation. Glenn, I want to start with you. Explain the demonstration you have for us. Well, I'm linked by modem and telephone to our offices in Sausalito, and I've got the program running, and my colleague Ted at the other end is going to load a map of the area. Ted. Load the map. <laughs> okay. Just wait for the modem to be sure it's running. So you're talking to Ted on the phone while your computers are also hooked up to send this graphic. That's right. And you can't actually do both at once. What we do is we switch between data transmission and talking. So is this an encoded picture now of the entire screen, or how is this, this uh, transmission actually taking place? What's happening is uh, we recorded the motions that the pen, this digitizing mm -hmm. pen, took at the other end at one time to, to, to make this map. Okay. And what, he's what loading are we seeing now? What are we seeing now? He's, uh, he's loading the map, which is just a sequence of lines, or uh, this is an ocean, actually. Mm -hmm. And um, I can be doing things while he's doing this, but we'll just wait until uh, it's So this sequence in. of keystrokes that he originally uh, uh, performed uh, were recorded, and then those keystrokes were sent over here and then reproduced in. That's in right. That's right. I wouldn't call it keystrokes exactly, no, but key it was a, a recording. Yes, right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So essentially, with the phone line, you guys can not only talk to each other, but work on the same graphic at the same time. That's right. In fact, uh, to give you an example of working on the same graphic at the same time, I can add to this. I'm also recording the session as we go along here. Mm -hmm. I can add uh, to this while he's sending it over, so I can be. So if this were so some sort of a business presentation or something of that sort, then, then there could be some interaction going on mm -hmm. both That's sides. That's right. Mm -hmm. Barry, I want to turn to you, if I may. One of the concerns people might have in sending computer data over phone lines, for example, might be the security of that data. Mm -hmm. You've got a system, I understand, which takes care of that problem. Explain what your, your new grid system does. Yes, we recently announced a, a, a grid compass computer that has a, a high-grade embedded encryption in it. And what this allows you to do is when you transmit the data over phone lines or satellite or microwaves, it encrypts the data so that if it were intercepted, it wouldn't be exploited. Okay, now, now show me what you're talking about. Well, as, as you can see, when we set this up, I have it right now simulating it going over a phone line, although it's just using a null modem. And as I type the information here on this one screen, you can see that I'm getting the identical information on the other screen. By being able to set up the encryption algorithm, You can now see that the data going across the line is, in fact, uh, different. It it's almost looks random. And as a consequence, if someone were to intercept that data, they would not be able to make sense out of it. And as a consequence, the data is preserved and the integrity of the system is preserved. Now, this is, has obviously uh, military applications. Uh, do you see it also uh, going into the business areas and things? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. the, I, uh, the military probably is the, is the uh, area that has the most concern about the privacy of data. And although the other parts of the civil government Customs, Drug Enforcement, FBI, and those folks are, are also concerned about the security of their data. The commercial world, I think, uh, is probably the next uh, area or market for us to look at, although they haven't uh, seen a, a need yet to spend the money. I think when a major catastrophe happens, they'll realize that this, this information is, is available to those people who have a, a need to get to it, and certainly the electronic equipment is available to be able to intercept the data and, and make use of it. Barry, we have visions of huge supercomputers when we're talking to the Defense Department. I mean, somebody's running around with a grid doing something. How would this be used? Yes, well, it's, it's interesting, Stuart. The uh, interesting thing about the grid compass is because it is portable, it's also very rugged. It's all solid state. There are really no operational moving parts in this, so it does very well in a low shock and vibration environment. As a matter of fact, it could take a 42-inch drop and still work effectively. So from the military standpoint, because it is powerful and because it's lightweight and because it has the communications protocols they look for, it's an ideal system for them to be able to field immediately and take uh, full use of it. Gentlemen, thank you very much. We're out of time. Gary, this communications and computer stuff is very fascinating, and it's quite amazing to see what it can do. But our commentator, Paul Schindler, asks the question, do we really need all this technology? What do you mean all the lines to Venus are busy? 
But seriously, folks, interstellar communications is not only unlikely, it's not even going to be necessary until there's a lot of people in space. Alas, a lot of things that'll be possible with computers and communications won't be necessary, but they'll be done anyway. There'll be more and more access to databases, even though people aren't sure they need them. There'll be more electronic mail, even though most of us would rather some letters weren't delivered so fast. And, of course, the new car telephones are a perfect marriage of computers and communications. They couldn't work without computers. But the question that's not being asked answered is whether we need all this. As in so many other things, we could learn from the French, who are making sensible use of communications and computers. In France, they plan to throw out all their telephone books. People will look up phone numbers with computer terminals, saving both a lot of money and a lot of trees. You know, I think today's show was a great idea. You ought to get a peek at what's coming down the pike. But my concluding thought is that nobody knows. Nearly every advance in communications surprises most of the experts. Who knows? Maybe the next big change will be interstellar telephone calls. That's my opinion. I'm Paul Schindler. In the random access file this week, with the industry buzzing about the official release of AT&T's new 7300 series personal computers, Compaq Computer Corporation jumped into the new computer phone market with six new products of its own. The new line, dubbed the TC2500 Telecomputers, combine an advanced telephone with a desktop computer compatible with the IBM PC. Texas Instruments flexed its muscles this week with the announcement of its new Super Micro. The new computer, called the Business Pro, will be fully compatible and competitive with IBM's hard-to-find PCAT. The basic package includes a keyboard, 512K of RAM, and one five and a quarter inch disk drive for around $4,000. The company expects the move to double its present 1% share of the personal computer market. In the mainframe world, National Semiconductor has announced two new products to compete with IBM's new Sierra line of mainframes. The company promises lower prices and a more compact design. And Gene Amdahl's Trilogy Limited, after giving up on its efforts to build a high-powered business computer, has purchased Alexi, the San Jose supercomputer manufacturer, for $64 million. It seems to be a good match, putting one company, Trilogy, with cash but no customers and no product, together with a company that has a product but needs cash to promote it. So you say your spreadsheet isn't big enough, then listen to this. Boeing Computer Services in Bellevue, Washington has announced Boeing Calc, the first spreadsheet that is not bound by a computer's internal memory, but rather by its online storage. Boeing Calc is said to be truly three-dimensional, with rows, columns, and up to 1,000 pages. Speaking of large spreadsheets, here's Paul Schindler with this week's software review. What do you think of when you hear the name Higgins? Well, you think of butlers and then classy service. Well, that's just what you get from Higgins, classy service. And you see, PCs create the need for service. They take up a lot of room on your desk. Now, sure, you can use a PC to do a lot of things you couldn't do before, but you still need a calendar, a Rolodex, and an appointment book. Of course, you can get each of these functions in a separate program, but don't you think it'd be nice to have all of them and more in a single computer package? That's just what these people have done. Now, Higgins isn't much to look at at first, just another calendar and date book, you might think. But let's go through a lightning-fast demo, and you'll see it's more than that. It'll